Oh, hi there. Well, what an odd collection of systems we have for this week. I try to keep the subject systems pretty similar, but this week I decided, why not mix it up a bit? And these are all from either the mid-90s or early 2000s at the latest. So let's tear into these. Okay, let's start with the big guy. This case is manufactured by a company called Inwin, model Q500. Quite a popular case at the time, and really desirable, even to this day. And I see this machine looks pretty well pillaged. Somebody stole the floppy drive and most of the drive bay covers, but at least they left us that classic quad speed CD drive, most likely mid 90s. And this case has these feet at the bottom that kick out. Two on each side, of course. And those help prevent this giant thing from tipping over and throwing off the Earth's rotational axis. And here's the back. This is an ATX case, though that motherboard has quite a strange I.O. layout. We've got provisions for cooling fans up here. And that is one giant power supply switch. You won't have any trouble finding that. And apparently the keyboard and mouse ports are backwards. <laughs> that is funny. I wonder how they managed to do that. Yeah, that's definitely one of the more unusual I.O. layouts I've seen. I wonder if that motherboard was harvested from a desktop system. And it looks like we have some goodies in the peripheral card slots. That sound card looks interesting. Looks like it might be an Autogy or something. Got some kind of video card. Got our NIC. And a dial-up modem. Can't go without that. Okay, let's get this thing open. Now, opening up these cases requires you to first remove this top piece. Boy, is it stuck. Tell nobody's been in here for a while. Gonna need a pry tool. There we go. And now we can pull this gigantic side cover. It too is crazy stuck. There we go. There ain't many places to grab this thing. And looks like the pillagers harvested the hard drive. But at least they were kind enough to leave the caddy for it. That was nice of them. Whoa, this thing has one of those evergreen CPU upgrade kits in a Socket 7 motherboard. Yeah, I gotta start with checking that out. Let's get this audio cable out of the way. Wow, that lever is really hard to reach. How do they expect you to get to that? <laughs> There's just no way to grab that thing. Gonna need to get the pry tool involved. Well, that was poorly thought out. Interesting little thing. I guess the model is MX200 or MX Pro 200. I wonder what this whole thing's selling point was. Let's pull it out for now. And they certainly gave you options for RAM configuration. Either 672 pin SIM slots or two DIMM slots. Let's see what we have in that DIMM slot. That's 128 meg stick of PC133 made by SyncMax. Hmm, a warranty sticker. Surely somebody didn't warranty this system build. Okay, let's check out that sound card. Let's get that game port disconnected. And that is indeed a Sound Blaster Autogy from 2001. Man, I used to absolutely lust after these cards when they came out. <laughs> I was so happy when I finally got one. Of course, by that time, the Autogy 2 was already out, but I didn't care. This is model SB0090. Let's get that game port out of our way. And let's check out that video card. Yep, definitely basic. That's an S3 Trio 64 from 1995. This looks like it might have been harvested from a Dell. I don't know, that sticker looks kind of Dell-y. Now let's check out that NIC. And that's a classic Realtek with the RTL 8029 chipset. I was always so happy when I found these back in the day because I knew they had absolutely no trouble with Linux compatibility. Clearly a 10100 NIC, very nice. And finally, our ISA dial-up modem. Ooh, through-hole components. This thing is classic, from 1993. And of course it has a Rockwell chipset. This looks like a 28.8K modem. This system has quite an eclectic mix of peripheral cards, a sound card that seems quite new for it, and a modem that seems quite old for it. I'd have thought this thing would at least have a 56k modem. This is getting quite strange. Okay, let's go back to that evergreen CPU. It's supposed to be a Pentium-like CPU, 
with its main shtick being a clock speed of 200 megahertz. Looks like it's from around 1997 or so. And that fan is really dusty, so let's get it cleaned up. Now there's no way to disconnect this fan. It's soldered to that interposer board. I suppose I could desolder it, but I don't wanna. Let's just clean this thing out. Okay, I'm happy with that. Okay, let's disconnect all the things. You know, I've never seen a fan that takes power through a Berg connector before. That's interesting. And just like every Berg connector, it's a pain to unplug. There we go. Oh, hey, look what I found. That's one of the drive blanks, and looks like the other one's up there too. <laughs> well, that was lucky. That is the longest floppy cable I've ever did see. <laughs> Doesn't even fit in frame. Look, <laughs> that is ridiculous. Let's see, am I gonna save 60 cents today? Nope. Oh well, I tried. And there's some info on the motherboard. Seems to be from around 1997 or so. And I see tantalum caps everywhere. So we better check the power rails for shorts. Let's check 3.3. Brief beep is okay. That just means the capacitors are charging. We're good there. And the next two are ground. As expected. Let's see, five volts. Good there. And these two should be ground. Yep, another five volts. All good. Ground, ground, minus five volts. Good, good. I'll check the power on signal, why not? That's good. And the rest. All right, we're all good. Now that doesn't guarantee the tantalums won't explode. It could be that they just haven't failed yet. But for now, I can be hopeful. And I almost forgot. These in-win cases feature the very best in removable motherboard tray technology. And in order to adequately demonstrate that, I reinstalled all the peripheral cards. You see where I'm going with this. First, let's disconnect that front panel. So first we just pull this side panel. Then we remove these three screws. And then the entire tray slides out. Taking the peripheral cards with it. Isn't that crazy? I wish all cases could be like this. Now look at all the room you have for activities. Okay, let's check out our only drive. And it is a Mitsumi, manufactured May 1995. Let's just give it a quick bench test, just to make sure it opens and or closes. Let's see. Okay, it opens, but do you close? You do, with no fuss whatsoever. They certainly were built different back then. <laughs> and this power supply does not instill confidence. Made by Power Man, as indicated by the man, holding power. But at least its stated output capacity is not too outlandish relative to the weight of the thing. So let's see what it does. All right, are you a power man or merely a power boy? Let's find out. Power man it is. We are doing just fine. All right, that's five minutes. The power man powered through. Okay, I got a surrogate floppy drive in there so that we can boot. Let's give it some DOS. And see what it does. Nope, oh, power button sticks. You have to look at that. And we are posting. Counting and recounting the RAM, interestingly enough. And counting it a third time. I guess it wants to be triple sure. And we got the faults loaded, and that's good. Let's continue. And CD ROM drivers loaded. Let's see if it actually works.
Well, I don't think it spun up. Let's see. Oh, no, it works. It's just very quiet. All right, let's see what that 200 megahertz evergreen can do. And it's identified as an IDT wind chip, wind chip C6, and is performing about as you'd expect. And it has MMX. Okay, well, let's test the CD drive, why not? And it's doing as well as it can. Pretty good for being almost 30 years old. Okay, let's get out of here. But can it read CDRs? Let's find out. Okay, it just made a very strange sound. It doesn't seem happy about it. Okay, it might have given up. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, that thing doesn't know what to do. Nope, can't read CDRs. Yeah, I figured it would be too old for that. Okay, let's find out why that power button is sticking. It's probably just fetching up on some dirt or something. But you have to hit it, like, dead on. And sometimes that doesn't even work. So let's go ahead and pull this faceplate. Fortunately, that's pretty easy. It's just a bunch of clips. And it's just as sticky on the bench. Actually, more sticky, because it doesn't have that switch pushing it out. Let's go ahead and pop it out of its socket. That was not as easy as I was expecting, but it's out and didn't break. Let's just clean everything up. And see if that helped at all. No, it still sticks. Honestly, I think the clearances are just too tight in this. That may just have to be. It's definitely better though. It only sticks once in a while. Might as well clean up the rest of this thing. That's more like it. Now let's do the lower portion, because it's pretty gross. Getting in these little crevices is proving exceedingly difficult. All right, probably spent way too much time on that. Got it clean though. Okay, actually, with the backing of the switch, that button's working a lot better. It's not sticking at all now. So that's fixed. And I got our foundling drive bay covers in there. Well, hooray for a working socket seven system. And that CPU is something special. I just have a feeling. The evergreen stuff seems kind of rare. And what an odd mix of old and not-so-old hardware. Yes, I'm still coming to terms with the idea that the Autogy card is retro. It still seems new to me. Let's move on to the next system. Okay, proceeding in size order. A system I can actually get in frame. This thing is branded Tiger GT266. And none of that rings a bell to me. I wonder if it's just a manufacturer of the case. Because that Tiger lettering is actually raised. That's not a sticker. And we've got a Sony CD-ROM drive up there. In desperate need of a cleaning. Got a very ordinary looking floppy drive. And all the pen marks on that reset button tell a story of woe. And speaking of woe, that is a lot of rust. I sure hope that moisture didn't get too deep into this thing. And I certainly hope it's not from a battery. Though this thing should be out of the date range for the Varta curse. But here's the rest of the back. There's that giant power supply switch again. Could it be the power man? We will have to see. And this is an ATX system with onboard USB. Got some kind of basic looking video card, a dial-up modem, and some kind of sound card. All right, let's get into this thing. Got some convenient thumb screws back here. And a place to actually grab the panel. Hey, we got a hard drive. Hopefully it's not dead. Yeah, it looks like we were left out in the rain or something, or otherwise improperly stored. Luckily, it does seem to be contained to the outside and the very bottom. Maybe that motherboard lived. And this is another Socket 7 system. The CPU looks like an AMD K6 something. And I must say, excellent cable management. Well, let's get those out of here. Whew. 
<laughs> Look at that. That is expert mode. Well, I'm going to have to undo this Molex connector bundle. And we've got AGP graphics. And it's a Trident card. A 3D Image 9750 from 1997. It definitely looks like it has some moisture splatter on it, but fortunately no corrosion. Now let's check the dial-up modem. A pretty basic Connex Ant, or Connex Ant, one or the other. Definitely 56K. Something looks a little funny there. What is that? It's like something got hot. That trace is a little bit lifted. Wonder how on earth that could happen. Let's see, what's on the other side? Uh, I have no idea. It's a black box. Could be a relay or something. Oh well. Now, let's see that sound card. It's an ISA sound card. And I think this is a Labway card. Model A151-A10 with the Yamaha chipset. YMF719E-S. That's an interesting one. And fortunately, pretty clean being so close to that corrosion. All right, let's check out those robot brains. And not even a mere whiff of thermal paste, as was the style at the time. And hey, that's a regular old AMD K6. And I think that's the first time I've ever actually seen one. I've only ever handled the K6-2s. And that one's apparently clocked at 266 megahertz. Let's pull it out of there. All pins looking good. Let's just get that back in there. Now let's check that RAM. I'm definitely appreciating these ultra comfort release tabs. And hey, somebody must have heard my complaints all the way in the past. They actually marked the size and speed. That's a 256 megabyte stick of PC-133, if that is to be believed. Luckily, pretty clean. Okay, let's go ahead and pull this motherboard so I can better assess and or address any corrosion. Let's get that front panel disconnected. Should probably disconnect power too, yeah? Oh, that's in an awkward spot. Okay, the IO shield's coming with it. And I'm pleased to report other than a teeny tiny bit of rust on the serial ports, this motherboard is corrosion free. No trouble on the board itself anywhere. But check out this wacky bodge on the CPU. That looks like a 4.7K resistor. I've always wondered how much time they spent doing that until the next revision. That must be really labor intensive. Aw, AMD and VIA. That was my combo back in the day, because I was broke. Let's go ahead and knock this dust off. Come on, 60 cents. Ah, so close. That might be enough to keep the clock. I'm actually not going to change it on the off chance it did, so I won't have to reconfigure that hard drive. Okay, let's see how that CPU fan's living. Yeesh. It ain't living good. That thing sounds terrible. I don't even think oil will help that. But let's give it a try. And this fan's got jokes. <laughs> Just cooler. It also claims to be the best quality DC fan. The noisy bearing test determined that was a lie. Let's get at that bearing. Hate to ruin such high quality humor. Now let's dribble drabble some oil down there. And give it a run. And it might be helping. Yeah, I don't think the oil can help this one. But at least it'll survive long enough for a test. Let's clean up that oil mess with IPA. And then maybe this label will stick back on. I normally just use Kapton tape, but we need to preserve this humor for future generations. Let's get it all swept out at least. And it seems we've got some corrosion on this heat sink here and there. So maybe that was the best quality DC fan. It just couldn't handle water damage. And that is as clean as these components get. Okay, let's give that old AMD K6 a fighting chance. Eh, 
And apart from the horrible rust, something else caught my eye about the bottom of this case. This system was built by Tiger Direct. So that's what that Tiger emblem was all about. And I had no idea they actually built systems. I thought they were just like a Newegg competitor. So that's crazy. And this case even has a removable motherboard tray. Too bad I already removed the motherboard the boring way, but I still need to get to those drive screws. And removing that tray will make that much easier. Ah, the 90s. Truly a simpler time. Okay, it looks like all these drives come out through the front, including the three and a half inch drives. And that CD drive is on rails, so this faceplate has to come off. And it attaches with these springy, sproingy washer things that I always feel like are gonna break plastic. So that's gonna be fun. And hey, I found a date. February 3rd, 1996. That must be the manufacture date for the case. Okay, wish me luck. Come on, plastic gods. And <laughs> we made it. And none of those broke or are pre-broken. Love that. All right, the CD drive is straightforward enough. And we've got a single screw holding that three and a half inch drive cage in. And I guess we lift up on this. Yeah, there we go. Hey, I'm starting to like this case. And I love how they used hot glue to vibration proof these clips. Well, that's one way to do it. And here's that Sony CD-ROM drive, manufactured August 28th, 2002. So quite a bit newer than the rest of the system. And it looks like this thing has seen some liquid damage. We got some corrosion all over the place. And there's a label on the underside too. And here's that floppy drive, made by Samsung. Spindle feels good. Let's give it the usual refresh. Yeesh, what a mess. I don't have high hopes for this drive, but let's clean it up the best we can. Gonna have to get that face off. Yeah, there's more than a few signs of water intrusion in this drive. And this here is actually mostly rust. Let's just see how it goes, I guess. Now let's make sure those heads are super clean. And amazingly, they were already clean. Well, that's surprising. And let's refresh that grease. Now I better leave a very clear message to my future self about that rust. And for the hard drive, we have a delightfully non-rusty Western Digital Caviar, 4.3 gigabytes, manufactured March 3rd, 1998. And even the underside of the drive escaped that nasty corrosion. So there's a slim chance this thing might work. All right, a potentially water damaged power supply? This could get interesting. I sometimes like to open these up so we can see fireworks if there is any. Let's go ahead and get that thing apart. I'm afraid that warranty can't help you. Well, that fan is quite inconvenient now, isn't it? We'll just shove that off to the side. Okay, apart from being very dusty and gross, I don't see any imminent danger, so let's test it. All right, it is thing doing time. Okay, so far so good. Okay, five minutes without the fan. Did no harm at all. This thing's good. The time has come. Time to see if that hard drive will grace us with an OS exploration. Let's hope it works. Ooh, that CPU fan sounds terrible. And I don't think that hard drive is working. Yeah, I figured this one was a long shot. That sounds very stuck. Sure sounds like it's trying though. And we are not posting. Okay, well let's figure out why I didn't post. Okay, that beep code usually means video card failure. So I've gone ahead and hit that AGP slot with Deoxit. Let's see if that changes anything.
Okay, no beep that time. And the hard drive sounds better, and it's posting. All right, that was it. And the hard drive's detected. Oh, it's still making that weird clicky, sticky sound. Memory test fail. That's an odd one. Okay, well, let's just try to continue. And yeah, the hard drive's working. And it's booting Windows 95. I guess it just needed to unstick itself. Okay, well, we seem to be frozen. And it doesn't sound like the hard drive's fault. So maybe there is something to that memory test failure. Now, I already cleaned and hit it with the oxit. Maybe I just need to go over it again. Let's try that. Okay, so I had gone over it with a pencil eraser, but maybe that just wasn't aggressive enough, so I'm gonna try the fiberglass scratch pen this time. Just very lightly. And let's give that ram slot a second shot at the oxit. Okay, still with the memory test fail. I guess I'll just try replacing that CMOS battery, though I highly doubt that has anything to do with it. And if that doesn't work, I'll try another memory stick. Maybe this one is just bad. And as expected, that didn't change anything. So let's try some different RAM. Okay, I just happen to have this 128 megabyte stick of PC-133 handy. So let's see what that does. And there we go. Yeah, it's definitely getting further now. <laughs> Whoa, that's a Tascam Porta Studio. And it's worried about my monitor, or my fake monitor. Well, I bet there's definitely some cool stuff on here. Huh, subtract the ads. Was that really an early ad blocker? What is that? Ad subtract filtering enabled from 2002. Over 10 billion ads blocked. And not a single one more. Yeah, the concept of ad block is not that new. Let's see what's under the ads tab. Okay, nothing. That's interesting. This guitar grid something caught my eye. Guitar grid method. What's all that about? How to see your way around the fretboard. Yeah, this looks like a little guitar trainer. Got arpeggios, intervals, and pentatonics. Well, let's see what it does. Interesting. Maybe now I can finally figure out how to play that thing. Oh, well, that's cool. I guess it's not like interactive where you can actually hear the things you're supposed to be playing. I guess not. This program could have been a website. Let's click next. See what that does. Okay. More static images. Let's try clicking one. Okay, it just enlarges it. Well, that's cool. Let's get out of here. Netscape Navigator. Of course I'm gonna open that up. Wow, they're actually using the Netscape profiles. Start communicator as whoever that guy is. Well, I think we've been conquered by IE. Let's not do that. Wow, it still has the old Juno website cached. <laughs> Look at that. Missing a few fonts, though. Cached from May 16th, 2002. We have found a bit of history here. So what was going on in old 2002 on the Juno website? An early banner ad for Amazon. And some Enron stuff. <laughs> what a time capsule. And some stonks. Look, <laughs> the Dow only 10,000. Let's see, can I still buy these? Please? I wonder what clicking any of these does. Let's see. Yeah, it's just gonna error out. Because it only cached the home page. And it's gone. No, oh, there it is. Let's see. And some 9-11 stuff. I didn't even see that at first. Well, let's see what's in their bookmarks. This looks pretty heavily used. These folders sound awfully specific. Pretty sure these were auto-generated by something. E-Linux. What are the chances that's cached? None. What else is in there? A 
Looks like all generic stuff. But at least they were nice enough to give Linux a nod. Okay, let's see. I don't know if this has any kind of browsing history. Except from what's in here. Which is empty. Okay, let's get out of here. Uh-oh. Not my Netscape registry. Let's see if they're actually using AIM. Eh, it doesn't look like it. I guess Netscape installed it. And what else do we have? Ooh, what's in that Yamaha folder? Y station. That sounds vaguely familiar. Hmm, I remember using something like this. I guess that came as part of the sound card driver. Okay, let's get out of here. Let's see, what else? Let's see what version of Microsoft Word that is. Word 97. And I guess they already assassinated Clippy. Let's get out of here. What is Deniba? Canvas 7 SE. What is that? Okay, some kind of graphics design thing. Which I have never heard of. What does that spooky ghost do? Okay, I don't have the first clue how to use this program. But it does stuff like that. And supports vector graphics. Probably. Okay. That's cool. Let's see, what is this? Carry? Don't have the first clue how to pronounce that. Omni Page Limited Edition. Okay, I guess it's some kind of scanner interface. We do not have a UMAX scanner. Okay, that answers that question. Oh, I have 24 sessions left. And apparently it does OCR. Wonder how well that worked. Let's get an idea of when this program was released. 1996. How good was OCR in 1996? <laughs> what is Presto Page Manager? Sounds like some kind of website thing. Okay, apparently it's not in there. One, two, three, free solitaire. Windows already has free solitaire. But this one comes with spyware. Oh, this has all kinds of games in it. Got golf and free cell. Let's try good old Klondike. Ooh, it makes sound too. Okay, let me not get into this. <laughs> it's only 1995 with a plentitude of features. Oh, you know it's good when they use the word plentitude. Okay, keep going out. I'm guessing Poolmaster 2000 is from the same publisher, but maybe not. Everybody's using the 2000 moniker back then. Uh-oh, I don't have the registry key. Let's play the trial version then. Your Poolmaster 2000 trial period has expired. Aww. But it's gonna let me play anyway? What was that? Couldn't even generate that love tap in real life. No, <laughs> physics are quite strange in this. Let's get about a half power shot. Okay, I know I can make that one in, right? What the? I call shenanigans. Okay, if I can't make that one in, I give up. <laughs> well, I made the four. That wasn't what I was aiming for. <laughs> well, that's cool. There's all kinds of stuff on here. And there's more. Okay, what is Studio Buddy? I saw that on the desktop. It looked dead. Mm, maybe it's not. Studio Buddy is digging up some bones. <laughs> the Home Recording Helper. This program was written to help home recording enthusiasts and studio junkies benefit from our years of experience in the trenches in some of America's top recording studios. Interesting. How do I record a snare drum? Well, I could definitely see the value of this before Google existed. Yeah, they give you a lot of really detailed info. Interesting. Well, that's cool. 
Let's get out of here. So this thing is definitely heavily used. Let's see what kind of documents we have. Yeah, we've got some documents. What's in their favorites? Oh my. So that's where all the real bookmarks are. Yeah, this person was really into audio. Well, that's a lot of bookmarks. <laughs> Give me my money now. Okay, this might actually be web history. So I guess they were using Internet Explorer. Let's see if that page is cached. Nope. Let's see, history. Well, not much history. Let's get back in that favorites folder. There's just so much. And there's more. Whoa, <laughs> old eBay listings from 2004. I'm always surprised at how much life people are able to squeeze out of these old systems. Let's see, is that the newest one? Looks like it. I can't believe these are still going. Uh -huh, finally, the end. I'd sure like to know what these eBay listings were. I wonder if there's more info in the URL string. Nope, just a bunch of gobbledygook. Okay, what's on the root of that hard drive? About three quarters of the way full. What is up with all these file files? Those are scan disk artifacts, which could mean trouble for this drive. Let's see, let's get some date stamps. What's the newest? September 2005. Yeah, I'm gonna guess this thing was being used up to September 2005. That being the newest Scandisk log and all. Let's see if the documents have anything newer. Nope. Okay, September 2005 it is. Okay, let's try the floppy drive. And it works! Sounds a little cranky. I guess five pounds of rust will do that. I'm surprised it works at all. Okay, how about the CD drive? Well, it opens right up. And it did spin up. And it appears it does work. And they have auto run disabled, so good on them. Yep, works just fine. Okay, now, how about the hard drive? With the sounds that thing was making on first start, I am dying to know. So let's drop down to DOS mode, run ScanDisk on it. Well, the file system's clean. Well, let's see if we get any bad sectors. Uh-oh, I think we found one. Yep. Skip undo. And that's a bad sector. I think that was the only one. Yep. I'm honestly surprised there was only one. We got the impending hardware failure message. Okay, now. It's time to see if my rust removal technology is advanced enough to handle this. This is that deep, scaly, penetrating rust. So I don't expect it to work great. And this is just regular old CLR. Let's just spread that around. I'm gonna stop it from getting on that label. Okay, let's give it some mild agitation. Yeah, something tells me this is gonna be mostly fruitless. Let's see how far we got at least. Well, given enough time, it might work, but this is the type of rust I would use a sandblaster on, and I'm not breaking out the sandblaster for this one. Let's at least spruce up that CD drive. Good enough. You know, nothing triggers my nostalgia quite like digital audio stuff from this era, so this one was definitely homey. My friends and I used to play around a lot with that stuff back then. I'm so glad that hard drive came to life and gave us that OS exploration. It's too bad about this case, though. It's definitely a candidate for sandblasting somewhere down the road, but not this week. And I can't believe despite all that corrosion, everything works. 
The resilience of these old systems never ceases to amaze me. Let's move on to the next system. And the last system is also the oldest, or at least the oldest case. I see it has what I think is a seven segment display. Either that or it's an IRDA transceiver, but those are usually smaller. I see we have a CD burner harvested from an HP, as well as a regular old 52 speed CD-ROM. And this system actually has a ka chunk ka -chunk power switch. So definitely an AT system. And we are sporting an Intel Pentium 1, MMX, but I've been lied to before, so we shall see. And AT system confirmed. I see we have a PS2 mouse port there. That's most likely a breakout shield that connects to the motherboard. But there's our keyboard connector, 25 pin serial port, nine pin serial port. I'm guessing that's a parallel port behind that cover. Yep. Got some kind of video card, the good old dial up modem, and we got some SCSI action. That's interesting. And finally, got some kind of sound card. It looks like it might be an interesting one. All right, let's get in here. And like any good AT case, the entirety of the outer shell comes right off. All right, we're looking pretty clean in here, though I don't see any signs of a hard drive. So that's too bad, so sad. It is a socket seven system. Let's get these cables cleared out. Let's check out that video card. And that's a Diamond Stealth 3D, fully loaded with all the VRAM expansions populated. I'm curious why that chipset says on board. This is clearly not on board video. Well, I suppose it's on this board. Fairly clean, just mildly dusty. Ooh, that edge connector needs to be gone over. Now onto the modem. Typical Rockwell modem. Not sure what speed it is. And they could have done a better job of cleaning up their flux. Now let's see that SCSI card. And external only. That's interesting. I wonder why the brand on that chipset's blacked out. Interesting little thing. I'm sure I'll find a use for it. And now the sound card. And that motherboard's just a little too flexible for that. Gotta hold it down. That thing's really holding on. There we go. And hey, it's another one of those Labway cards with that Yamaha OPL chipset, another YMF719-S. So these systems had a lot more in common than I realized. Very nice. Now let's check that CPU out. And it is indeed an Intel Pentium with MMX. And of course, they never even heard of thermal paste. Let's pull that out of there. And there it is, stepping SL27S. No trouble on the pins. Let's get it back in there. Now, what have we got for RAM? Hmm, those are IBM chips. And it's a mystery stick. No size or speed indication. And I'm not Googling chip part numbers. Let's check out the next one. Nothing on that side. Aha, that's a 32 megabyte stick. At least someone cared. And with this being a motherboard in between worlds, it accepts both AT and ATX power. So that gives us some options. And this motherboard's either a quick technology or I will. At least that's what the retro web says. Model P55XB2. Okay, let's clear out all of these breakout shields. And disconnect the front panel. Oh, oh boy, it's my favorite, a removable motherboard tray. Though not altogether an uncommon sight on an AT case. Look, they definitely wanted you to know about that European conformity mark, indicating compliance with certain European Union regulations. It's actually embossed in the metal. And we just have a single screw up here. 
It looks like this must slide. Awfully stuck. Oh no, there's one more screw in the bottom. Goes from the bottom up. Yeah, that's more like it. That will never not be satisfying. And fortunately, we don't have a barrel battery. Luckily, by the time this board came out, the world had already realized that rechargeable batteries on boards were an absolutely stupid idea. All right, is it my lucky day? Let's see. <laughs> nope, that thing is completely flat. Absolutely nothing. Tell me how the air has more charge than that battery. Close enough. And that CPU fan seems to be in excellent shape, just like the rest of the system, but let's see how it sounds. Sounds great. We just need some very mild dust removal. That was quite possibly the quickest de-dusting ever. Now, possibly for the first time in its entire life, somebody's gonna do right by that old Pentium. And here's that 52-speed CD-ROM drive. And I thought we'd never see another one made by Top Glory Electronics. The last time we had one of these on the channel, it was not very glorious. Got a manufacturer date of October 2001. Let's wipe that off. And there's the HP CD Burnerator, manufactured September 1999, 4-4-24 speeds. This was quite nice for 1999. And I guess these early burners generated a lot of heat. They always have cooling provisions. Sometimes they even have a fan. And tucked away in the back here is the make a model for that floppy drive, the TEC FD235HF. Let's give it the usual service. Well, not too terribly dusty. There is a bit though. That won't take too much. And I'm having to really detail this thing. There's little dusty crevices everywhere. At least the heads were clean. And this power supply is branded solar power. I don't think that means what they think it means. And it has a warranty that voids itself. Saves me the trouble. Do not remove this power supply cover under any circumstances. Well, no wonder they didn't want you to open it up. Look at those teeny tiny heat sinks. That explains why this thing was so suspiciously light. Let's give it some trouble. Okay, not bad. Just a little bit high on the voltages. Okay, it's been about five minutes and we're just about 11 or 12 degrees above room temperature. I'd say we're good. All right, it is time. And they do have that clock speed configured. And we are posting. Got 98 megs of RAM. And an I.O. port conflict. That's interesting. And I almost forgot to get a disc in there. I was way too eager to see that seven segment display. Okay, let's continue with defaults. And sounds like the floppy drive works. And we're only seeing one of those CD drives. And could that be because I only plugged one of them in? Yeah, like I said, way too eager. There, that's more like it. Much better. Let's test them out. And that opened kind of lazily. And sounds like it happily spun up. Let's see, I think that one might be S drive. Nope, fail, I mean abort. Let's go to R drive. Yeah, there it is. That's odd because that's actually configured as a secondary drive. They had that cable all flip-flopped in there and I didn't feel like adjusting the jumper settings, but I guess it all worked out. Well, how about the burner? Slow, slow. And that one opened right up, but it's dusty. And I swear, there's nothing better than these microfiber cloths for removing dust.
yet it was lazy going back in. Sounds like it's struggling a bit. Eh, maybe not. Let's see. Man, it does work, but it was awfully slow. Okay, let's see how a real Pentium compares to that Evergreen CPU. Quite a bit better, although this is 33 megahertz faster. So there's that. And just because I want to hear it scream, let's test that 52 speed CD drive. I've already got a disc back in there. I just love how angry those things sound. It just sounds like the disc is gonna explode. And sometimes they do. I've never had it happen to me, but I've heard stories, credible stories. Okay, that did well. Now let's test the other one. Interesting how that one slowly ramps up. Yeah, what an odd curve. I wonder what causes that. But hey, no errors. Okay, let's get out of here. Let's see if either of those drives support CDRs. Oh, time to start failing, I guess. Sounds like it likes it. And indeed it does. Now watch, the CD burner will be the one that doesn't like it. That'd be funny. Maybe it does. Yep, sure does. Well, how about that? I'm gonna say I don't usually have such luck with older CD burners reading modern CDRs. Okay, let's see if we can actually boot to Knopix. Let's just get all those other discs out of there. Control Alt Delete. Okay, maybe we're not configured to boot from CD. Or maybe we don't support a Tappy Boot. Let's find out. Let's see, BIOS feature setup, boot sequence. Ah, no CD-ROM support. Oh, there it is. Okay, let's try that. Yeah, there it goes. Boot. Now we're really gonna hear that thing scream. Undefined mode number, don't care. Oh, not enough RAM to start KDE. Well, tiny window manager it is. Okay, well, it booted something other than DOS. That's good enough for me. Let's shut this thing down. Oh, not pseudoing. And with this being an AT system, no automatic shutdown. Gotta push the button. So tell me, is there anything more wholesome than a seven segment clock speed indicator? I think not. This case is definitely badly in need of some RetroBright, which I really, really need to get into. But hooray for yet another living Socket 7 system. It's pretty funny that all three of these systems were. They had a lot more in common than I realized. Well, it turns out this wasn't such an odd bunch after all. All Socket 7 systems. I guess it ended up being a theme video after all. Now, imagine if you will. A world where I can install hard drives in every system, do operating system installs, full case restorations, release multiple videos per week, and much more. You could help make that a reality by supporting the channel on Patreon. And to everyone who's already a supporter, thank you all so much. But that's all for this video. Thanks for watching.